Now for many viruses, we can't conveniently measure infectivity. We can't do plaque assays or even limit dilution assays. And so we're reduced to using other measurements. And in some cases you can measure infectivity, but some of these approaches that I'll tell you about are uh, more rapid. And we'll talk about um, four of these today. There are five listed. We won't talk about electron microscopy. This is taking photographs of viruses, of course, at very high magnification. This would be useful in looking at new viruses that you're discovering, see what they look like. Um, but also, if you want to know how many physical particles are present in a sample, you can count them by the electron microscope, and there are ways to know how many particles are present. So, for example, if you have a, a new virus you discovered and you want to know what the particle to PFU ratio is, uh, you have to look at it under the electron microscope. So let's talk about hemagglutination uh, and measuring viral enzymes, serology using antibodies, and then measuring nucleic acids. Hemagglutination uses red blood cells to detect virus particles. Uh, it's based on the idea that red blood cells have receptors for some viruses and they will bind to them. The viruses don't replicate in them, uh, so red blood cells you could say are susceptible but not permissive to infection. Uh, but they will bind and they will act as an indicator. So hemagglutination for measuring influenza virus particles was developed in 1941. It was the first assay for eukaryotic viruses. The idea here is that red blood cells will bind influenza viruses. So for example, this single red blood cell on the left will be coated by influenza virus particles and then that red blood cell will bind to others by virtue of the virus particles on the surface and so on. And you make a lattice which forms a very nice uh, sheet in a 96 well format such as this one. So again, you add viruses to red blood cells if viruses are present in your sample, uh, they, the red blood cells will agglutinate. Uh, the virus, again, will not replicate in the cell. We're simply attaching the virus to the receptors on the, surf on the surface of these red blood cells. Now, at the lower left is a 96-well plate showing a hemagglutination assay in practice. We call this an HA assay for short. And what we have here, A, B, C, D, E, etc., are different virus samples, and then there are dilutions, two-fold dilutions of each sample uh, along in the columns. And you can see here, for example, virus sample B has no virus in it. There's no hemagglutination. When there's no virus present, the red blood cells within 20 minutes tumble to the bottom of the well and form this nice little button. If virus is present, the, the red blood cells form a lattice, which coats the well, and you can see a very nice lattice here and in this one as well. So this, let's say this sample right here, sample D, is hemagglutinating HA positive out to, uh, let's say, 512. That's the last well where we can see hemagglutination. So the HA titer of this sample is 512, the reciprocal of the, high, the uh, highest dilution at which you get uh, hemagglutination. Now you see the earliest wells, the lowest dilution of these samples, which are HA positive, <coughs> have little buttons in them. What does that mean? Well, as we'll talk about later, uh, influenza viruses not only can attach to red blood cells, but the particles, the virus particles have an enzyme in them that reverse that attachment, have an enzyme that cleaves the virus from its receptor. So at very high concentrations of virus, this is apparently an HA negative reaction because this enzyme is very active. But you see as you dilute it out, you get hemagglutination. If you incubated this plate for another half hour or so at room temperature, all of these wells would turn HA negative as the enzyme cleaved off the virus from its receptor on the red blood cells. This is why we read the HA assay very quickly. Another way to measure uh, virus particles, again, this is not infectious virus. The HA assay does not measure infectious virus, but simply viruses that are attaching to red blood cells. Another way we can do this is to measure enzymes in the particle. Many viruses have enzymes in their particles of various sorts. Uh, some have, many have nucleic acid polymerases, which can be readily assayed. So retroviruses, which are shown here in an EM on the left, and schematically on the right. These are enveloped uh, viruses and in their capsid within the envelope is a enzyme called reverse transcriptase. 
it's the blue dots here, and this copies the RNA genome into a DNA. We'll talk about that in great detail later. This enzyme could be readily assayed for simply by adding a substrate, say, and a precursor so that nucleic acid polymerization can take place. So if you have a sample suspected to have retroviruses in it, you treat it with a little bit of detergent to permeabilize the membrane so your precursors can get in. You add labeled, radioactively labeled triphosphates and some, some uh, magnesium, for example, uh, and then they will pass through the permeabilized membrane and you also add a substrate that can be copied and the enzyme will copy the substrate into a radioactively labeled product which you can then detect. And the next slide shows you an example of that kind of detection. Uh, here we have three different cell lines that are either mock infected or infected with a retrovirus either undiluted or at 1 to 10 and uh, these are samples taken at different days after infection. And it's, these samples are simply cell culture supernatants. They are then mixed with a little detergent, some radioactive triphosphate, and other materials uh, so that the reverse transcription can take place. And then the products are filtered on the filter paper so that you can detect them by autoradiography. So you can see here some of these samples, uh, some of these cells are producing infectious retroviruses as determined by um, the incorporation of radioactivity by the particles. I shouldn't say infectious. They're producing retrovirus particles that have enzyme in them. Uh, this doesn't tell you that these particles are actually infectious. You can see this cell line is not producing any retroviruses, uh, and this cell line is at a lower rate than, uh, again, I've said infectious retroviruses, but I mean retrovirus particles. So that's an enzyme assay that you can use to detect um, retrovirus particles. We use antibodies extensively in virology. One is to detect the presence of viruses and viral proteins in cells. And here's an example of one way to use uh, antibodies. This is a procedure called immunostaining. In this procedure, we have an antibody which is directed against a virus protein. You can make these by immunizing animals with viruses or virus proteins. And then you incubate the let's say infected cells in this case with your antibody and then detect the viral protein by the presence of the antibody. So in this is a, in panel B is a cell monolayer infected with a herpes virus and the cells have been stained or incubated with an antibody to a herpes viral protein and there are two ways that you can detect the presence of the antibody binding to your viral protein either directly or indirectly you can label the antibody itself with a fluorescent indicator so that the uh, indicator will fluoresce say when you put ultraviolet light on it there are many different ways that you can detect this either by UV or other ways uh, dyes chemicals of various sorts you can either directly add this indicator to the antibody or you can add the indicator to a second antibody that will then bind to the first which is in turn bound to the viral antigen. So what the picture is showing is um, an antibody that is used to detect herpes virus proteins. The antibody is labeled with a, uh, a fluorescent indicator that becomes green under UV light. So you can see the viral proteins here in the nucleus. This uh, cell monolayer has actually been stained with two different antibodies at the same time, one against the viral protein, the other against a cellular protein to show uh, the cytoskeleton. And that's been labeled with a different color indicator, that one indicator, that one's in red, of course. Now, antibodies are used in many ways in virology besides immunostaining. Uh, we use a procedure called immunoblotting or Western blot analysis. And here we can tell uh, the size and abundance of viral proteins, say, in a sample. Uh, so in this experiment, we have placed samples of virus-infected cells and fractionated them on a protein gel. So this is, uh, these, these proteins, the individual proteins, are separated according to their size by an electrical current uh, passed across the gel. The gel is then taken out of the apparatus and placed in a apparatus where we can then transfer all these proteins to a membrane 
a sheet. So this is called a blotting tank. Uh, you have the gel in here and the, on top of it is placed a sheet of either nitrocellulose or some other membrane uh, and then the proteins transfer to the membrane. You take then the membrane out of there, you put it in a tube and you add your antibody. And wherever proteins are attached to the membrane, if they react with the antibody, you can then eventually detect them. You have, you have antibodies with indicators on them that will then give you a signal, say, on an x-ray film. So of all the proteins that were separated, if these were, say, infected cell proteins, you can tell which ones are viral uh, by them being detected by the antibody on this western blot. And you can see this is very powerful. You can not only see the size of the protein, but you can do kinetic studies where you make samples at different times after infection, and you can see when proteins are made in infected cells, when they're turned off, and so forth. So quite powerful for research. This is also used in the clinical setting. It was used early on to diagnose uh, individuals with uh, human immunodeficiency virus infection. Another use of antibodies is the ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. This is often used for rapid diagnostic tests as, as well as other uh, research-based assays. And in this assay, we can either look for uh, the presence of a viral protein in a sample, that's shown in A, or the presence of an antibody in a sample. All right, so let's say you have a specimen, say a respiratory, a nasal wash, and you want to know if there is influenza virus in it. What you do is you have a plastic surface or some other syn synthetic surface on which you have attached what are called capture antibodies. These are antibodies against the, uh, one of the influenza virus proteins. And then you flood that structure, that solid support, with your respiratory specimen. If there are viral proteins present, they will bind to the antibodies that are on the support. And then you use a second antibody with an indicator to detect the presence of the viral antigen. Now, if no viral antigen is present, that indicator antibody will not bind and you'll get a negative result. But if viral proteins are present, uh, the second antibody will bind and you'll get some kind of a readout, typically a color change of some kind. And uh, many of the rapid dipstick type in-office tests uh, done for virus infections are, are built on uh, this kind of an assay. Now in other situations you want to know if an individual uh, has antibody to a virus. So typically if someone has had a virus infection and you'd like to know that person has recovered uh, and you'd like to know what they're infected with, you take some serum and you look for antibodies to the virus. In this case what's attached to the solid support is some viral protein that you've produced and purified. And then if you pass the serum sample over this solid support, if there are antibodies to the virus, the antibodies will stick to the viral protein. And again, you detect the presence of those attached antibodies with a second antibody that is attached to an indicator. Again, some kind of color change that will result. So that's what an ELISA is because you're linking uh, the reagent to a solid support and you use some kind of an enzyme to detect the presence of either protein or antibody. Now, this is used extensively in research in many ways, but we also use it, as I said, in the clinical setting and uh, used in, in particular in some in-office, in-physician office rapid uh, diagnostic tests.